effective a projection of will, for example? Well, uh, of course, you have to address projection of will in the fragile spectrum, because right. if they project will onto you, right. they, they lose reality testing. They're genuinely afraid of you. Right. Right. And so actually, and, and actually when we're, so what we do is we deactivate the projection and then invite them to hold it inside. So patient might say, I just feel like you're expecting something out of me. And with a fragile patient, we would say, well, actually, I don't need to expect anything out of this because this isn't my therapy. So the good news, you don't have to worry about that. Then you press the projection back in. The, the question is, is what, what are you expecting out of the therapy? What is it that you want to happen here that you think would be good for you? Now, when you push that projection back in, the fragile patient will kind of disrupt momentarily because they're having trouble owning right. their will that they want something. And then as you keep that pressure up, eventually they're able to own their will without disruption and therefore without projection. Now, when you invite them to own their will, that's actually your initial pressure to aggression. You're not even talking about anger yet, but see, will is the, is the kind of the lightest form of aggression. I want something but they have trouble saying, I want even to talk about myself. So pressure to will is actually your first kind of pressure, but you're trying to deactivate a projection, help them own something inside rather than place it outside. So it's a really a structural problem. Can they handle it inside? Now, in highly resistant patients, we have a different situation. Patient says, patient says that, uh, um, yeah, I just feel there's something you want, want out of this. Now, in this case, you'll notice that the, the patient now doesn't have trouble declaring his will. He's actually willing against you. He's willing against the therapy. He's actually quite comfortable with his will. So, and, and also when he says, uh, when he says, yeah, well, I'm just having to kind of submit to you, he's able to intellectualize about this which lets us know, oh, I represent a dominating figure to whom you submit. He's already telling us about the transference. So we don't have a will problem. We have a transference problem. He's in relationship to you. So in that situation, you might start the same way. You might say, well, keep in mind, uh, since this is not my therapy, I, I don't need anything to happen here. But insofar as I represent someone to whom you uh, have to submit, obviously you're going to have a reaction to that. So insofar as I represent this judge or dominating figure, yeah, what feelings are coming up toward me? You go immediately to the feelings toward you. Now, with your fragile patient, it's different because, you know, you say this, I don't need anything because this is my problem. First, what is it that you want that you think would be helpful for you? And you help them own the projection you know, so that they want something from you. They want something from you. And when they can own that they want something from you and they're disrupting, and then they can own that they want something from you without disrupting, and they can intellectualize that this is what I want. Then you ask, so I wonder, given that this got stirred up, I wonder what feelings are, are coming mm -hmm. up here with me. So you actually have to take care of the projection first yeah. before you go to feelings in the T because they have to own something inside in order to feel it toward you. High, high resistance, they don't project it out of them. So you can just lightly touch on it, but then you go, it's a tactic. In his case, his, his saying, well, you, uh, you want me to submit and you're wanting something out of me. Then you see the patient actually is, um, it's a tactic to keep you at a distance. So you lightly touch on it and then you start to ask for feelings toward you. Now, uh, Fatima was asked, could you explain more about difference between highly resistant patients and high resistance with repression? Sure. Highly resistant patients in isolation, of, uh, when we say highly resistant patients, we mean highly resistant patients in isolation of affect. So these are patients, as we just saw, where they intellectualize, they can diversify, uh, they can rationalize. And they can use isolation of affect to detach from their feelings and to detach from you. The moderately resistant patient in isolation of affect detaches from feelings. The highly resistant patient in isolation of affect detaches from you. So in that sense, then, when we're looking at a highly resistant patient isolation of affect, 
Their resistance system is isolation of affect, their anxieties and the strided muscles, and their defenses function as a system to keep you at a distance. And that, that patholo- the defenses create a pathological relationship we call the transference resistance, right? In this case, um, Samantha represented a dominating father, and this patient was in the role of a submissive son. So in that, and he's doing that as a way to avoid the feelings. So Samantha will address his resistance and ask for the feelings toward him until there's a breakthrough toward her. Now, high resistance with repression. Remember, it's not high resistance in repression. It's high resistance with repression. So you'll have some patients where they can resist a little bit, maybe in the T. They can resist you a little bit, but then their ability resist drops, and then they begin to go into self-attack and somatization and so on. So you have a range of people in repression. You have some people where they just simply repress. There's very little ability to intellectualize. We're asking for feelings toward the therapist and building capacity. We have patients kind of in the middle where they they can intellectualize some. You're able to explore feelings. They're able to intellectualize, detach maybe a little bit from their feelings. And but then as feelings rise, then they go into self attack. And and then we have to again go to feelings towards you to get them out of repression, back into isolation of affect. Then you'll have some patients that have more capacity where they can resist a little bit in the T. They they put up a barrier. But then as you address that barrier and ask for feelings, yes, then they'll, they'll shift into, uh, they'll shift in, into repression and self-attack, and then you have to build their capacity. So when we're really looking at repression, we're looking really at a spectrum of, of capacity. Thank you. It was very useful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's important to remember that fragility is a spectrum. Um, repression is a spectrum and also uh, resistant patients. Uh, this guy is, Um, We have some patients that enter and they're very collaborative. Uh, They give you a problem. They give you a specific example. It seems to be going smoothly. You ask for feelings. There's defenses against feelings. And then somehow the therapy starts to get stuck and it's like they've begun to resist you. So they started out looking like a moderately resistant patient, but as feelings rose, the resistance enters the room and then it turns out you have a highly resistant patient. This patient began his therapy most likely highly resistant, somewhat collaborative, but somewhat collaborative, but kind of keeping a distance at a distance at the at the beginning, uh, detaching, not quite fully involved with her, a little bit skeptical, a little bit distant. He was already resisting. He's sharing he's sharing his comments very freely. There's a very good unconscious therapeutic alliance. He has very openly told Samantha the transference that he has to her. She's not having to guess. I represent uh, a a dominating judge who wants him to submit. It's a very clear transference. He's told her very clearly. So the unconscious really has been very open. So he is highly resistant in terms of the fact that he's avoiding emotional closeness, avoiding collaboration. But the UTA is really quite functional here. And he does come, he's, he's wanting her help. He's in conflict. You can also have highly resistant patients who come in and, and they don't even know what the problem is. They can't tell you what the problem is. They don't think they have one. And so you're in a bind. What do I do? They have no problem, no specific example. There's nothing to work on. And that would be kind of character resistance. That would be an extremely resistant patient. But it's to illustrate for you that even with highly resistant patients, we have a spectrum of patients. Even here, Samantha had a hard time believing we would call him highly resistant because he is sharing his thoughts quite freely with her. He's he feels he has to submit, he's resenting her, but you know, in what in one way, he's very collaborative, sharing this transference resistance but he's avoiding emotional closeness with her. And that's what we mean by highly resistant. He's not an obnoxious patient at all, right? He's not, he's not overtly defiant. He's, he's not devaluing her. None of the things we might find with the extreme of a character resistance, but he is avoiding emotional closeness. And that's, that's what we were helping Samantha see today. Yeah, that he's highly resistant because he avoids emotional closeness and isolation of affect. Thank you. Other questions, comments?
Oh, so you were all saying, what about the working lines with this patient? And as such, seems you go to mobilization, not clarifying the working lines. There's a risk of a misalliance where he won't be clear about what he's doing in therapy. Actually, actually, in, in a case like this, um, when when you say so, in in so far as you see me as a um, see me as a dominating figure who wants you to submit, you're obviously going to have feelings about that, right? So can we see what feelings are coming toward me? That is going to mobilize the unconscious therapeutic lines massively. And he's really going to become much more energetic. Oh, you can tolerate feelings because you're actually by your pressure, you're inviting a very different relationship than he's had before. Now, as you get, then go forward, you're going to be... You're going to be making links. So I didn't ask. Uh, I asked uh, Samantha not to tell us her history, but Samantha, I'm guessing that this guy has um, has been depressed. He's anxious in social situations. He um, he does okay in his job, but people, uh, but he hides his capacities. Probably not advancing professionally. Has an impaired relationship with a girlfriend, something like that. Well, he doesn't actually talk about his girlfriend at all, although I know she exists. Um, mm -hmm. but he's at university and he's um he's not feeling like he's doing well at university like he's studying music and he has problems with um he doesn't feel like his um lecturers are feeling positive about his work and that kind of thing and yes mm -hmm. certainly the earlier stuff you said depression great, great. although he wouldn't use that word depression but yeah and so, certainly very socially anxious that's one of yeah. his right. and one of his positive aims sure. for therapy is to be more collaborative with in his university work to be able to form relationships and good um so yeah. we would make links when you're doing your resistance identification, you'd made links to his symptoms. So he understands why you're doing it so that you can say, right. So insofar as you um, view me as a, as, as, as a judge before whom you would never be good enough, um, you're letting me know that's, that's nothing personal to me because this is the same pattern you say that happens with your professors uh, at the university, right? So I wonder, uh, shall we just take a look and see what feelings are getting stirred up toward me? So we can see what's what's driving this um, this fear that you're going to be criticized. Yeah, what feelings are coming toward me? Um, so so insofar as you're afraid I'm a dominating person and you have to submit, right? Otherwise you'd be rejected. Um, you're letting me know also this is not personal to me because you're saying this is also what you fear with your professors that if you don't give them the right answer, yeah, that you could be rejected. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that this is also the pattern that happened with your father as well, right? Right. So shall we just see what feelings are coming up here toward me? So we find out what's what's driving that that problem for you. Yeah, what feelings are coming toward me? So insofar as yeah, you're afraid of my judgment that that nothing you say to ever be good enough. Yes then that would really explain why you would feel anxious with me. And you're letting me know this is the same pattern you're running into social situations because somehow the shadow of your father falls onto these people. And then instead of a social gathering, you feel like you're surrounded by a bunch of judges who will find fault with you, right? And so naturally you get very anxious. So bad news is that, that you're feeling that I'm going to be another judge like your father. Uh, but the good news is that happening here uh, so we could look at it. So shall we just see what feelings are coming up here toward me that, that's, that stir up this whole judgmental dynamic to get going? Yeah, what feelings are coming up here toward me? So in this way, when you do your resistance work, you're always making links to the past, you're making links to his current problems. So he begins to understand why it makes sense. Otherwise, Samantha could look like some narcissistic person and think, what are the feelings about me? What are the feelings toward me? What are the feelings, you know, she could seem like some crazy narcissist, right? So it's very important not to, not to do that, but to be always making links between what's happening here and how that makes a link to the professors, how that makes a link to social situations, how that links to father. So the patient begins to realize, oh my gosh, this is the pattern that connects everything. This is the pattern that's causing my problems at school, that's causing my problems in social situations, uh, that causes problems with my father. And in this way, then it also helps the patient then begin to reflect on this pattern 
And then he understands why Samantha's asking for these feelings, not because she's just a narcissist. She's asking these feelings for these feelings toward him in order to sort out what's what drives this pattern uh, of relatedness that's that's crippling his life. Uh, let's see here. Um, Karen saying, does submission usually hide lack of collaboration, promote a stance of incapacity? Well, if a patient is submitting to me, she's not collaborating with me, all right? Or if this patient submits to, um, to Samantha, he'll have the same crippled relationship with Samantha that he had with his father, and that'd be a disaster. And well, I've got to submit to you. And I'd say to him, yeah, but if you submit to me, we'll have the same awful relationship here that you had with your father. Why do that? Because this submission is just the way you learn to hide with your father. But if you submit with me, then you'd be submit, then you'd be hiding from me too. So could we look underneath this facade of the submissive son? and find out who you really are? Karen, does that help you understand how we would think about submission and then how we'd address it? Yes, I think what was confusing for me for, for a moment was um, me thinking of it or relating to it more to a question of will mm -hmm. than a question of closeness. That's right. Which That's is right. close related, but... Um, mm -hmm. Yes, that was more my perspective than actually the mm -hmm. closeness itself. So, yeah, that was a good emphasis. Another way to do it is, that, yeah, but if you submit to me, right, then you'll be hiding your power and capacity. And then you would just get better at pretending to be the powerless son you were with your father. So I wonder, could we take a look underneath that submission and see the real power and capacity you actually have. So if we look underneath that submission, submissive facade, yeah, what feelings are coming out toward me? You notice when you frame things in this way, now the patient says, yeah, I would like to take a look at those feelings. Yeah, I would like to find my power and capacity. I, I would like to know who I, I, I would like to stop having to be the submissive son, right? These are ways that then the, because it's, the therapy needs to make sense for the patient for him to do it, right? And your and pressure to feelings needs to make sense to the patient. Otherwise, they're just submitting to you and they're, whole, I don't know why you're asking this, but I hope it goes somewhere, but I'm going along with it. Well, then we just have a, you know, we basically have a set of masochistic relationship and we're calling it a therapy and, and, you're, and we get into problems. So that's where these links are so important. So the patient understands, you know. Can I have ask a question? Yeah. I, I hope it will be clear. Um, um, when we're talking, I'm thinking uh, about what can we understand or how we, we, we understand the forces that uh, the, the unconscious, how we understand how the unconscious works. So with a patient like this, when there is a, the, um, uh, the dynamics of uh, submissiveness and uh, dominating, um, I think of us as a service when we clarify those uh, links, uh, we also, uh, I'm thinking what, what mobilizes uh, the emotions in the patient or the UTA, because uh, I'm thinking about one aspect of it is by, by making those links and by actually uh, having, um, being someone who really understands the patients, we also uh, actually, like, we also a uh, person who, who knows something. And then the patient feels like, hey, he really understands me, but in another way, hey, now he understand, he helped me, he helped me understand something that I, uh, it was hard for me to understand by myself. Yeah. And now it, there is, a, I don't know if there is like a part that, hey, so he's the one that he has experience and knows, knows how to uh, understand people. And I, I wasn't, and I think maybe if, if this, if, the unconscious works the way that this dynamic, this relational dynamics brings up the, the feelings or it's, or we can see, or we think about it as some, something else that mobilizes it. Well, uh, that's kind of what's exciting about therapy. Uh, we don't know. Right. Because when you understand the patient, that's a stimulus. Mm -hmm. Now, how the patient responds to that really depends on their unconscious conflicts. 
right? You could have a patient whose envy is stirred up so much that he says, oh, that's a bunch of crap. Hmm. Uh, you could have another patient who who's really mobilized to work harder. Um, you could have another patient who spontaneously starts bringing unconscious links that, that elaborate this. You could have another patient who becomes anxious that you understand. Says, Are you able to read minds? So you see, the thing is, is when you understand it's a stimulus, and then we just have to wait because the patient's responses are going to tell us what kinds of unconscious conflicts got activated now, and how does a patient handle those conflicts? And that's exciting because we can't know in advance. We just wait and says, oh, wow, I've got a borderline patient who needs to devalue me, or mm. I've got a, got a patient who's... Um, uh, who who has a threshold to uh, to losing reality testing or oh wow I've got patients unconscious totally unlocked here you know it's just we don't know that's kind of what's exciting it's also a little scary for us because it's lot not like one answer fits all or we'll always know what to do but it speaks really I think what you're speaking to here is just the unpredictability really of the response and in, in the excitement yeah thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, other questions, comments, uh, questions. I think, John, what you are, you know, describing again and again and again is doing uh, doing a lot with a little, like how you elaborate and elaborate, you know, making links, asking for feelings, clarifying resistance, and uh, you know, the thing is, of course, we need to make sure that the patient is is with us, <laughs> that we have, that we have a patient that uh, on on a conscience level and and on an unconscious level. Uh, right. Time. Well, we have to make sure the patient is with us, and we have to make sure we're with the patient. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> of Let's course. not forget that piece. You know, so so we we've helped we've helped Samantha really be with the patient in a whole new way now that she can see, oh, no wonder, yeah, how understandable that he would take a submissive stance, how understandable he would hide, uh, given the father he had. And and he, while he couldn't tell Samantha his history, he's enacting his history, and that's perfect. And now that she sees that, she'll be able to talk about the, she'll be able to identify his resistances and ask for feelings, and she'll be able to link this behavior with her as nothing personal to her, but that this is a pattern we can see that what happens with her happens at, at school, happens, you know, um, social situations, what happens with the father. And in this way, by her understanding and showing she's really with the patient, the patient really experiences that. And this really helps the patient understand, oh, this, so would it make sense for us to look at what the feelings are that are driving this uh, repetitive pattern? Yeah. Obviously, you don't intend to do this repetitively, but it does happen, doesn't it? So shall we just take a look and see what the feelings are underneath that are driving this? Obviously, then, obviously you want close relationships, but these mechanisms are preventing you from having the closeness and freedom you want. So what makes sense for us to look at the feelings underneath those mechanisms so we can see what's what's driving that, that pattern of self-sabotage. And this is another thing, too, to make clear to the patient. He's not doing anything, these things on purpose. They're unconscious. They're outside his awareness. They happen automatically. You just make it really clear he knows that because then he realizes, oh, you're not criticizing me. And that's also why I'll say, so if I notice any of these mechanisms, yeah, that would be um, interfering with, with your ability to own your power with your professors or in social situations, do I have your permission to point out any of those automatic behaviors so you can be in control instead of those behaviors being in control of you? See a little pressure like that, patient understands, oh, that's why you're doing this. Okay, you're not criticizing me, but you're going to describe behaviors that are hurting me. And that way, then the patient understands why you're doing this, why it's important. That's that's a way that you can avoid a lot of misalliances down the road. If you just make it clear that you realize they're unconscious, he's not doing it on purpose, doing this pressure to, 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 to the task so he understands what you're doing, why you're doing it. 
yeah, you can avoid a lot of misalliances that result from just really misunderstanding, patient not understanding what we're doing or why we're doing it. Yeah. So we're working alliance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. John, could I just ask you, like, you know, when you're asking a patient for feeling like in this um, scenario, mm -hmm. in my mind, I'm expecting anger, but then oh, I also oh, feel oh, a bit oh, disingenuous oh. about that. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay. I'm never expecting anger. Okay. You see, when I ask what feelings are coming up toward me, I'm asking the unconscious, where, where, does, where does he need help right now? If he offers anger, that, that's great. That's fine. If he gets too anxious, that's fine. Then I'll regulate it. If he offers a resistance to emotional closeness, perfect. Then I can help him with his resistance to emotional closeness. You see, I'm not asking for feelings. I'm asking for supervision from the unconscious. So when I ask, yeah, so what feelings are coming up toward me? You know, so I ask it in a very light way. I'm not looking for feelings. I'm looking for unconscious supervision. Mm. So when I say, yeah, what feelings are coming toward me, the unconscious is going to send me an answer. Maybe it's unconscious feelings, maybe it's unconscious anxiety, unconscious defense. Either way, the patient has collaborated and the patient, the next answer is just telling me this is where I need help. Mm. So in a way, when you ask what feelings are coming toward me, I would ask it with this idea, with the idea of when you ask it, you're really asking, where do you need my help now? Mm. And you're asking a question of the unconscious, unconscious, where, where does he need help now? And the unconscious will always give you the answer. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad you mentioned this because I think too many times therapists want, I want a feeling, I want a feeling. And the therapist patients, I, I know you're wanting a feeling, but I, I, I just don't know, you know, and they're feeling like you're greed, like you're wanting to get something out of them. Instead, mm -hmm. yeah, we're just asking for unconscious supervision. We're always getting exactly what we need. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't have to get something out of the patient by asking, yeah, what feelings are coming up toward me? The next response from the patient perfectly expresses where he needs help. Mm -hmm. So if you understand that, you're always getting up the perfect expression of where the patient needs help. Mm -hmm. So with this, then your sense of pressure becomes very, very different. You're just asking the question, patient basically, yeah, where do you need help next? Where do you need help next? So when I'm asking for feelings, it's never about feelings. It's just where do you need help next? Because it'll mobilize feelings and maybe I'll get anxiety, maybe get resistance. That's all right. Oh, you need help with resistance. Oh, you need help with giving up. Mm -hmm. Oh, you need help with this transference resistance. Okay. Mm -hmm. How's that change your how's that change your perspective, Samantha? Yeah, no, I I I heard you. I really like, I think I agree with you. And you've actually said that before and I really liked that it freed me up mm -hmm. at the time because like you said you're asking for the diff or, or you're getting whatever you get you know like you said unconscious supervision I suppose what I meant was like I I I would expect him to be angry with me on some level somewhere deep down angry with me well hang on this. hang on hang on he's going to feel everything toward you okay he's going to feel anger he's he feels love that's why he's feeling love. That's why he's holding back. He's going to feel angry. He's going to feel love. He's going to feel grief. He's going to feel pain. He's going to feel gratitude. He's going to feel everything. It's just mm. what order does it come on? Yeah. What order does it come on? Yeah. This is hopefully will kind of help free you up in your pressure. It's just, yeah, yeah. where do you need help? That's all it means. And you're just asking the unconscious. That's where mm. you're, that's where you're talking. Well, thank you so much, Samantha. This is a thank great you so experience. Much, I hope John. you found it helpful. I really feel very grateful. Thank you. Oh, my my pleasure. My pleasure. All right. I will see you all very soon. Take care, everyone. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you very thank much. You, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.